Good morning. Congratulations for being here, and uh, thank you for that. Um, we'll uh, we'll get started. In fact, let's let's uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll get uh, going. Our thing. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day out, and we thank you for that. But we thank you most of all that you are in our hearts, and that you are with us, and that you never leave us or forsake us. Uh, we just thank you for this time together this morning. Help us to grow together in you, to grow in our understanding and appreciation of the gospel and on how that should look in our daily life and how we should declare that through our daily life. Thank you, Father, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, last week, uh, Steve presented, um, I think the title was The Gospel for the Long Haul. And uh, so we want to start just a little bit this morning, think about that, talk about that. For me, that's, that's probably the hardest part of my Christian life, is having people in my life, especially family members, who don't know the Lord and don't seem interested in knowing the Lord or have heard the gospel and basically say, yeah, I wish I had your faith, but I just don't. You know, other answers like that, or, or one who, who's very, well, very different from me in other ways and just doesn't even want to talk about it. Um, so how, how do we do that in a way, but how do we stay at the praying for them? How do we stay at the considering how might I be a good influence on them? In fact, is there anybody here that has a testimony of one of those people in your life, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a coworker or some other contact in your life that you prayed for for many years and you saw the Lord get a hold of their heart? Does anybody have an example of that? Yeah, Karen. Um, my whole family, well, my whole immediate family, first family I ever really had. Um, <coughs> my dad and my brother. Uh, over the years, over many years. Yeah. That's right. In case you didn't hear in the back, Karen was talking about her mom, her dad, and her brother. That was your brother, right? One. Mm -hmm. uh, over, over a period of years, not just all at once, but uh, a, lot yeah. a lot of years. Mm -hmm. So that's, and see, that's the thing we have to remember. Not only is God faithful to hear our prayers, um, we don't know what his plan is, and so we just have to keep that. Someone else has a hand back. Yes? Oh, my great-grandpa. Your great-grandpa. Tell me a little more. Um, he had the faith shaker, and he just, like, started, like, listening to our podcast, and so he got saved, and then he was baptized again. Like, That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Someone else, these are just, these are, gives me, gives me goosebumps. I thought I saw another hand. Yeah, Judy. Uh, uh, my brother, his, he, was, he, was, he was baptized this year as a child, but he never walked with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he's always resistant, mocked, you know, Christian, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, he has dementia now, and he's in a special facility. And, but I, my heart is, I mean, I keep praying, and I keep going. So I went to him, and he's always been resistant, but as I was leaving, <laughs> I thought, I'm going for it. <laughs> I'm going to invite Christ into his life. I just went through the salvation prayer. But even he was praying it all out loud. And, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what all transpired in him because we can't talk about it. Yeah. Except that's the only thing he just really articulated. Yeah. This prayer of salvation. And so now when any of us, my sisters and I go to see him, we say, <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think that's another point that we need to make is we don't really ever know. I mean, someone can be cursing God to the day they take their last breath, and it's kind of obvious that they're they're not. But I think, like with my father, he he had more of a testimony of faith as he got closer to death. And um, you know, I asked I asked him about his his salvation and stuff, and he'd refer back to like when he was in the army and in the fox, you know, the foxhole prayers and stuff like that. And, and um, um, so, you know, I do believe he's in heaven today, but, you know, that's really not 
mine to say for anyone, but it's nice to hear that he, that he did that. And like my nephew, I have this nephew that, you know, you pray for your brothers and sisters and you pray for their kids. Well, this one nephew was the type that was just had disaster written all over him his whole life, you know, and he, he last, someone get, took extra special pains to get an exception to get him into the army because he had no, he was sort of, you know, had nowhere, he wasn't headed anywhere in life. And he lasted a month before he got kicked out, you know, and, and so forth. Well, lo and behold, he got married at my house uh, to a nice woman uh, a few years back. And uh, just almost overnight, the two of them started expressing faith on Facebook. And uh, the one I'd never, I mean, I prayed for him, but I'd really kind of, in my own confession, I never expected that this particular nephew would ever even think about God, much less, you know. And um, so it's, it's great to see how even the ones that we pray for, in a sense, oh, you have little faith. <laughs> Any other particular testimonies? I know, um, yes, David. I just want to share quickly that it's uh, an older man who's got grown-up kids and grown-up grandkids. You know, we do our very best when we rear our kids. We, we, we try to instill in them all that it means to be a lover of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live mm -hmm. a life that is uh, responsive to him. And so they get trained, and yet you realize that when they hit 17 or 18 and they are making adult choices and they leave home, that they have now taken responsibility for their own decisions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Jeannie and I have learned is that we have to let them make those mm -hmm. decisions. And that's when we really learn to pray. And, and also <laughs> learn to realize that their lives aren't going to be mimicking my life because yeah. they're different people. Yeah. Even though they all five of my kids have the same training and the same emphasis, yeah. they all apply it in such different ways. Yeah. And their lives are and yet the ways in which they honor the Lord and the decisions they mm -hmm. make are theirs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, we keep praying. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for the ones that uh, are making choices that yeah. bewilder us. Yeah. Well, and that's another thing that, you know, the, the, the sort of the gospel in the long haul, we pray for um, people even if they are apparently saved. <laughs> I mean, what does the scripture say that's most, one of the most scary passages in scripture for me is the Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he said, depart from me, never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. So, you know, we should pray for each other that, that our faith would be genuine and that we would really walk in obedience and uh, so forth. But so hopefully this has been an encouragement to you, this last one on staying at it, not growing weary and doing the good work of praying and seeking how you can um, speak truth to, to your loved ones, to your coworkers, your friends. Um, anybody have a testimony of having looked at that eight to 15 and something that changed, like did you start praying for somebody that's different now that you weren't praying for, that you recognized? I need to really think about, well, does that person, I mean, I see this person, I work with them, do they know, do they know the Lord or not? Anybody have a particular testimony of what has come of our discussion of, of the, both the long haul and the, the sort of eight to 15, the, the people in your life? Raise your hand if you have people in your life that don't know the Lord. Ah, it's universal. Okay. That's the point. We want to grow together in our appreciation of that fact and the fact that God wants to use us to touch their lives. And uh, we recognize that it's not easy. In fact, it's impossible in my own strength, right? With, with, without the Lord, no one's going to respond to the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God has to draw them. Our job isn't to convince them. What's our job? What's that? Present the gospel. Another way to put that, other, other phrases, be a witness. Testify to the truth, speak the truth in love. Plant seeds. Pardon me? Plant seeds. Plant seeds, plant water. Maybe you get to be in the harvest. Um, so, yes? I have one that I've been working with. Uh, one of my caregivers, she was an ex uh, Catholic, but she tells me that she really knew Jesus and he was a savior, but I don't see a lot of fruit. And I hadn't really talked too much about it. She's the one that takes care of him on Sunday, so she goes on his regular church. Yeah. Uh,
Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for this, these times together to grow together, to encourage one another to walk in obedience, to walk by faith, to, to take those steps outside of our norm, to go beyond my comfort zone maybe. And so hopefully, hopefully God's helping you grow in that way. Uh, so the next, we have two more weeks after today. Uh, next week, Nathan's gonna talk about sharing the gospel with people that have other religions in place. Um, you get the people to knock on your door, you get people you meet at work, maybe there's um, you know, even family members that have, uh, have adopted a, maybe you come from a family with a different religious background. Um, so that's that. And then the last week, we're gonna kind of try to wrap it all up and look at how do, we, how do we take all these things and what are some practical ways to continue to grow together in this. So with that, Walter, you wanna come and share? Uh, well, he'll, he'll give the title. I, I'll leave him to do that. And then I've got discussion questions we'll hand out toward the end here from Walter. Can't have it. <laughs> All right. Um, let me get this. All right, so today um, the topic, let me see, there's one last piece that's missing, this. Okay, the topic is serving in light of the gospel. And as Charlie said, um, we've been talking about sharing the gospel, declaring the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, what is it? Who's God put in your circle, long-term evangelism? How do we speak the truth? Today, I wanna think about, um, do I have that on there? Oh yeah, I do, uh-oh. <laughs> So what about good works? How do good works focus in on this? We have like charity, like, so what about, um, we call them like mercy ministries, charity, um, things like that. How does that fit into local outreach? Are we, is local outreach about declaring the gospel or is it about doing good works? Or about both, yeah, I know, okay. Okay, so um, what we're gonna talk about is doing good with a gospel focus or the role of good works in outreach, okay? So that's what the focus is. And so we're gonna start with just a little bit of discussion here, kind of some brainstorming to kind of get going. Before we start though, when we talk about good works, um, in fact, when we talk about good works, when we talk about gospel, when we talk, well, not gospel, but we talk about good works and outreach, I wanna think broadly, because there's a lot of what we do that sort of fits in that we can build on. So good works, a few things to think about is, you know, meeting physical, social, psychological, spiritual needs of others, meeting people's needs in this world and spiritual needs, you know, and beyond. Okay, so that would that would that would include that. So giving our time, energy, money, and resources, right? There's a sacrificial aspect to this, typically. Good works really even include um, our actions, our attitudes, our behavior, our speech. Okay, so you know when we talk, we talk about things like you know, well, well, how I come off, how I present myself, even when I'm not doing it explicitly, like feeding somebody <laughs> or things like that. All of these things matter. And then finally, consider things that are just individually, you're serving people as an individual or the group of friends, right? But as a, as a sort of an unorganized thing, but there's also organized like big time, like huge like parachurch and church ministries. So all of these things count, okay? So broaden your mind when you're thinking about that. Okay, so here's what I wanna ask for some examples of things. Okay, so in our, it doesn't even have to be our community, in general, if I were to say like, what are some organizations that provide acts of mercy, care, good works type stuff? What are some examples? Christmas right, the Christmas child, Operation Christmas Child, absolutely. Yep. It's even broader than what Samaritan's Purse does in lots of other areas in addition to the Christmas child. Absolutely, so disaster relief, I don't even know what all the other things they might do. James Storehouse, they offer free stuff to kids in foster care and Awesome, yeah, so yeah, there's all sorts of things like that and like food banks, things like that where it's like providing, somehow storing, providing, collecting, and distributing real physical needs to people that really need them. Crisis Pregnancy Center. Yeah, Crisis Pregnancy Center. Rescue Mission. Rescue Mission, yep. So yeah, all sorts of things like that. And as we're gonna, we're gonna ask a few more questions about some of these just to, but in your minds be thinking about, all right, so I get the physical needs, and how do these organizations meet spiritual needs as well? What about individual actus, acts of mercy and care? So what, what about individual things that you do by, that you might do when you bump into somebody or deliberately or with a partner? How about like praising the unfamiliar? 
right? So yeah, caring, so caring for these, so these, these kids were somehow dropped into your life by God's providence, a long providence too, right? We've known them for a long time. And so now all of a sudden you're doing, I mean, you're kind of meeting a lot of this criteria of actions, attitudes, um, time, energy, money, is it a sacrifice to some degree, <laughs> right? So excellent, yep, that's an individual act of. Does caring for your neighbors help them Absolutely, physical needs, and then even the act of knowing, like kind of caring enough to have a conversation, you know, can really be a huge service to some people. So you don't say you do it for people in prime need, but health. Right, so um, are you kind of even saying like when somebody, somebody has a surgery, somebody has a baby, things like that, and we provide for those needs, like some, often it's sort of temporary, right, but it's an immediate need for some number of days, weeks, that's a big deal. We have walk-ins sometimes throughout the week, mm -hmm. and we'll talk with them and make sure we share the gospel with them before we help them. So. Cool, yeah, so people that come into the church, they just have some need and they're asking for it, and you get an opportunity to, to serve them. Okay, what about, and so. Do you want to give a good example, just yeah. like Cindy and Ellen Parrish, uh, bringing Philip and Roland every Sunday, yep. you know, and all the things they do, the volunteers and um, so mercy and care that comes at a sacrificial cost. So we've touched on this a little bit, and there's a sense in which all of this does happen that, but as we think about, I think that this sort of sacrifice of time, energy, money, thought, prayer is really a, uh, is something we'll consider as we go through. And what about, so okay, maybe not so much serving specific physical needs that somebody needs now, but what about individual behaviors, attitudes, speech, actions? How is that, in a sense, like a, a kindness or, you know, good works? Well, like something as simple as I can look at coaching softball as just coaching softball, or I can look at it as, as a gospel opportunity. Mm -hmm. My dad always looked at it as a gospel opportunity. So as a softball coach, what would be examples of things short of, like, literal gospel declaration? What are things that, you know, are good works that you're just doing? Just handle difficult situations. There's not a lot in the softball, <laughs> but just the way you approach mm -hmm. That's right, you make me think of Caleb as an umpire, right? You gotta, do you have a good attitude with that? And that's a real service to people when you can dial it back. Yeah, sorry, David? I was just gonna say, uh, like in the grocery store, where you shop, you smile more and you thank the person for their help. Right, so simple interactions with individuals that are just in your path. Absolutely, yeah, Judy? I was just thinking, we'll see it in the fellowship hall when we're out at dinner, what really is going on. The dog likes to reach out. <coughs> It does, it does, yeah. Okay, so we've talked about some of these things and so we won't dwell on it too long, but here's some things I wanna consider. So let's choose an example that maybe as we were talking about these things, piqued your curiosity or your heart. Can we use these kinds of things? We did a big range from like serious big organizations to individual things from acts of like real sacrifice, well, <laughs> you know, s significant sacrifice to smaller sacrifice of like my time and that sort of thing um, for all these ranges and different dimensions. How can that be used as a gospel, gospel opportunity? And when I say gospel opportunity, I, I'm gonna use these words probably as we go on, but what I'm thinking is literally saying the gospel or bringing somebody into the hearing of the gospel, okay? So it's actually, it's not just, you know, good works are not the gospel. Loving God and loving others, that is not the gospel, right? That's the law. It's good. But um, gospel is that we, you actually tell people, this is in the name of Jesus. Jesus died for my sin, for the sin of the world. He was buried, he rose again. And those that believe in him have eternal life. How can we use some of these things that are helpful physically, emotionally, socially, you know, can we use these things for gospel opportunity? I guess the, I guess the answer is an obvious yes. Should we? I guess it sounds like a silly question to answer, but should we, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate to use softball coaching as a gospel opportunity? So we're gonna think about these things. Why should we use these things as gospel opportunities? Because Jesus said so. <laughs> Jesus said so, yeah. And so say some more about that, like uh, it's, just, you know, I guess it's like, you know, well, preach the gospel to all creation, right? right? It's to do it. It's not just in compartments. It's whether we're coaching softball or going to the grocery store or what. Right, so, yeah, in all areas of life, not compartmentalized, yeah. The whole principle of what are good works. Good works is nothing more than an outgrowth of your faith. Mm -hmm. 
And in any demonstration of your faith is meant to glorify Jesus Christ and bring him, his example into your life. So everything we do is really a gospel opportunity, whether it's, but I think something that you're going to hear is sometimes we need to put words to our gospel opportunities. Yeah. And, and to not just be, you know, gabbing them dumb about it and not say anything. That's my problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I um, sometimes need to, as my son would say, close the deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. The door open, sometimes we need to actually ask people, do you understand, would you like to pray? Very good, That's, that, that is helpful. And so other things that we're gonna talk about are what are some ways that we're gonna be most effective in sharing the gospel in these situations? What makes us ineffective? And that kind of gets what you're getting at, Dave, and, and that's my issue as well. Probably it's not an uncommon thing, but sometimes it's hard to, well, we'll get into what makes things difficult, at least in our minds. But, so the idea is, is that um, we are called to good works, and, and that could be these formal acts of service or informal things, in, informal encounters, how do we convert them, you know, to gospel outreach? Okay, so the two principles as we go through, and oh, you can open up to 1 Peter chapter 2 um, as we're doing this, but two principles that we're going to talk about. First of all, loving others, and Steve last week, um, you know, mentioned this. Oh, yep. <laughs> so Steve last week, you know, mentioned this, that stuck with me that, you know, People that we're serving, people that we're talking to, people that we're praying for, people that we want to reach out for, they're not projects. And this is a temptation it, when, we, when we focus a lot on, okay, I need to get in the game here. So either in terms of pure gospel outreach or in terms of helping other people, especially there's certain times where there's such a, you know, the uh, kind of the, I don't know, the wealth disparity or the need disparity is so different. You have so much and somebody has so little. You know, you can feel like a project. Well, I'm going to help this person and, you know, that sort of thing. But by loving other people, like if, if loving others fixes sort of the problems that we have, and um, so that stuck with me. So when we think about love, right? Love is patient, love is kind, it's not rude, it's not arrogant, it doesn't boast, those, those things, that will prevent us from, um, from a few things, from serving without love, you know, but it also prevents us from not going further. The more we love somebody and actually care about the person, the more, you know, it'll impact how we do these these, these good deeds, which we'll get to, and it impacts, it'll really force us to push forward and meet their spiritual needs as well. So, um, do you think that having, I mean, because the mm -hmm. It is, it is, I mean, and we don't stop, and there's, we can have, we can have imperfect love as well, right? So I think it's, it, you know, and we have to stoke the love. I mean, that's the case for me. Uh-huh, and that's, that's love, right? It's more love than I don't care. Yeah, no, I, 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 I absolutely. And I, and I do, I mean, this is probably true, and as we get to know people, as we talk to people, as we pray for people, your heart starts to get bound to them in a more organic way, where that love turns into more of an emotional love. So one thing is loving others. Um, the second thing, and it keeps our talk authentic, right? Sometimes I worry, am I feeling a little bit, you know, or am I reading a script? And it's actually, as I love a person, then it's no longer a script, it's, it's I'm appealing to this person. But the second thing that I wanna emphasize as we go through these things is we're not really called to evangelism per se, we're called to glorify God. And nothing glorifies God more than sinners turning to him in the name of Jesus, Jesus being seen as the great savior he is, God being seen as the kind God who forgives. So this is very helpful for, for to me, that's I think the ultimate goal is not evangelism, but it is, it's glorifying God. And that plays that our good works, oh, they glorify God and it, turn, it converts into you know, speaking. And that speaking, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But Matthew 5, and I, I, should, I should have this really memorized, but um, I don't wanna mess it up. But as we all know, Jesus says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, right? So we're gonna be talking, using the metaphor of light in some of our other passages. You are a light of the world. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. They put it up on a stand so it gives light to the whole house in the same way. Let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, okay? So it's seeing your good works, giving glory to God in heaven, but 
This is implied. I'm gonna, something that must be implied in there. Seeing good works does not necessarily glorify God. You might see somebody, I don't know, pulling somebody from a burning building. That doesn't necessarily glorify God. When, things, when these good works are done in the name of Jesus, that gives the glory to God. If somebody says, wow, you're such a nice person, what would I do without you, right? That, that glorifies me, that doesn't glorify God. So anyway, it, when, we, when we get to passages like this and it says glorify God, think, what does that mean? How is God really glorified? Can he be glorified by your good works if, if they don't know Jesus, if they don't know who is giving you the power and the resources to do that, who's actually through you helping them? Okay, so loving others and glorifying God are the underlying uh, principles. Okay, so we're gonna do this a little bit quickly. I will try not to speak too quickly. But First Peter, so First Peter can be read a number of different ways, but Peter is talking to people living out, you know, around the empire, and it's an encouragement to them. You will, you will be suffering, but you have great hope as well. And one thing that struck me as I was just reading through First Peter this week, I wanna get there too, is how this applies to this good works and gospel outreach. Let's see, Peter, well, wherefore are you? Okay, so First Peter chapter two, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with, <clears throat> and the reason why if you have your Bible it's helpful is because we're not gonna cover every verse in there, but they all sort of have something to do with this. So first of all, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament is this, you're, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, right? Beautiful, awesome, that's who we are and why it's so that we could proclaim his excellencies. Can you do that without speaking? Not really, I mean your words back that, or your actions back that up, but you can't really do that without speaking. A couple verses later, so I'm gonna go down to verse 12. Um, verse 11 says, beloved I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of your flesh which wage war against your soul, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now isn't that interesting? Um, think about this, unbelieving Gentiles, they speak against you, but nothing sticks because your attitude, your, your, the way that you put up with suffering, the way that you put up with, let's call it persecution, but if you wanted to use a less word than that, just injustice, right? You're doing the right thing and yet you are still picked at or picked on or I don't know. But the interesting thing to me is they say, I mean, do we really believe that unbelieving Gentiles will see good deeds and glorify God? Like right now, these same people that are giving you a hard time, are they glorifying God? Well, on the day of visitation, all right, the day of the Lord comes, are these evildoers going to be glorifying God when judgment comes? Well, that doesn't sound quite right either. I think what this is getting at is they see your good deeds and people will be affected and impacted, especially as they know that it's through Jesus Christ who has rescued you. And um, I think this is implying that people will be converted. God will save people first by seeing your good works and then implied by hearing the gospel because you know they can't be saved without it. So anyway, this is great encouragement to, to hold up under persecution because um, as they see this, their mouths will be stopped in the sense of they have nothing they can say really sticks. They see your good deeds and they'll glorify God on the day of visitation. It should be encouraging. Go a little bit further. Um, verse 15. Well, this is like be subject to to the Lord's sake for every human institution, the governors and, and so on. Verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So your good deeds, right? Whether it's your individual deeds, whether it's buying, kind, of, kind of banding together with other Christians to meet the needs of people, right? This will put, it'll silence the ignorance is how it puts it. But again, it's, it's a way of like, people might have accusations and you know, you see all, the, I see these things all the time where like somebody wants to do a law against some sin, right? And, and people will say, oh, well, I guess he's just like secretly like, he, I wanna check his web browser, you know? And that's the, the, the natural reaction of people accusing people of wanting to like have standards is, well, I guess he's perverted, but he just doesn't wanna say it. He's a hypocrite. Those are the kinds of things that um, as we maintain kind of a good conscience and we continue to follow Jesus in continuing to do good works while putting up with that kind of persecution or, or hard time. It's, it stops the mouths. But anyway, oh, sorry, I didn't, show the, I didn't show the thing. Put to shame the ignorance. I'll keep moving forward. If we move a little bit further forward, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good, 
oops, let me show this. <laughs> Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And now this is sort of the kicker. You read a little bit further down in verse 21. For this is what you've been called to, right? To suffer graciously. This is what you've been called to because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges uh, justly. I'll finish up with this. Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Um, you were straying like sheep, but now you've returned. Okay, so this is obviously, you know, see the example in Jesus, follow him, you're his people. But I think there's really more to it than this. Now, Jesus, of course, is the only one who can die for the sins for another person. It is through him that we're rescued. We can't bear anyone else's sins. But sort of like Paul says in Colossians, he says, I'm filling up in myself, you know, completing the suffering of Christ. The idea is, is that while here on earth, we are the people of Jesus, and he, he's not, he's not going to suffer here on earth, but as we suffer, in a sense, in his place, like he does, like he did, um, people can really come to faith through that example. When they see you, when they see this hope that remains in you, why would you put up with this? And the reason is, is because it's not just because I've been saved. It's not just because I'm following Jesus. It's also, he's got this promise for me. My hope is not in this world. It's not getting what I need right now. This is the hope that I'm looking forward to. And so essentially through our suffering, other people can come to faith. Okay. It should be a very encouraging, encouraging thing. Okay. We're almost done with Peter here. The next verse says, likewise, wives, and I want you to see like the continuation of the idea here. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won, oops, without a word, by the conduct of their wives, when they see respectful and pure conduct. Okay, so in this case, it explicitly says, you know, without the word, but, but still, when the Christian wife is um, bearing under like the overbearing, non-believing husband, he, he knows where her strength is coming from. So there's a sense in which the words are there. But again, the idea is, is that by doing this good work, in this case, it's a wife loving her husband, despite, you know, the, the bad treatment, um, they may be one, right? So this is a really a thing that happens is as we serve, people will be one to Christ. It's not done without knowledge of the gospel of Jesus, but it's a very important part. And then the last part is this, I, I believe. So we, um, Again, it's, it's hard. It's, I wish I didn't have to pick out all the verses, but all of these things flow through these chapters. Finally, it says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, um, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and respect and so on. Um, so I, I just want to point out these couple of things here. So this is First of all, as we do this, we honor Christ as holy, as you're suffering, as you're bearing up under mistreatment. And again, when we think, uh, let, I'll, tie, I'll make this more explicit, but when we tie this back to our own service, you know, as you're always going to say, you're the best, thank you, right? Some people might not even acknowledge it, or they might give you a hard time for whatever reason, right? And as you bear under even that, we honor, first of all, we honor Christ in our hearts as holy, right? We acknowledge him as Lord, and as we do that, um, that that's, gives us that strength, always being prepared to make a defense, okay? So this is the case where we need to be ready. The good works are always tied back to the actual proclamation of the gospel. What is your hope? Um, and and, th and that, <coughs> that defense is tied to the hope that is within you, right? The reason that we serve now is because we have something so much greater awaiting us. We don't rely on what we have here and now. To, um, to satisfy us. We're waiting for what the Lord has prepared for us. Okay. So anyway, this is, so this is the, uh, kind of the summary of it. Good works matter. Your attitude, all of this, all of this uh, hinges on the fact that as you do these things, it's done with an attitude of sacrifice, generosity, joy, powered through hope. Um, the reason for your hope matters, okay? Again, not to labor the point is as we these good works this service is really important it's important for the person 
himself or that person herself just for his own good. But it's also, um, if the glory isn't turned to Jesus, then it's not gospel outreach. Okay, so very briefly in Philippians um, chapter two, Well, maybe I've got it written down here. I hope I do. So um, the real thing is actually starting in verse 14, but I couldn't help. But I want to point out that the New Testament really tells us this in a bunch of different ways. You'll always see these good works connected with the declaration. Philippians 2.12 starts off, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and this follows actually right after Jesus, you know, it says Jesus came down from heaven. He took on the form of a man. He gave himself to the worst death. God, he's been raised up so that everyone would bow and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. It sounds like such a little minor thing. It's like, if, if you say like, do all things with what attitude? This is a particular thing that he pointed out for whatever reason, without grumbling or disputing. But I'm underlying this as, how you serve with what attitude is, is critical. That you may be blameless and innocent. Can you be blameless and innocent if you're doing this good work, but you're either grumbling, you're like a martyr, right? It's like, oh, look at me. Oh, sorry, honey, I gotta, oops, that's, I was just gonna say like me, I gotta go to the elder meeting. Sometimes I come like, oh gosh, here we go. But, but the point says, but, okay, never mind. That's not being recorded, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> editing that out. But the point is, is the attitude is important. Otherwise, you're not blameless and innocent. Why does that matter? Children of God without blemish in the midst of a, of a uh, crooked and twisted generation. This is the same words that Jesus uses. We live in this dark world. And so we have this opportunity as we live this way um, to shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. And other translations say like holding forth the word of light. And I guess it's one of those Greek words that can go different ways. But it's almost like, look, we're shining as lights in the world. Look at what Jesus has done. Look at, look, I am, I am joyfully, cheerfully serving in this way. Just, I, I want to. He has put that into my heart to do this. And it's like you're holding forth this torch. And it's not just look at these good works that I'm doing. It's look at the Lord who's doing these things through me. So holding fast the word of life proclaiming that word of life, who Jesus is, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud. Um, and so this is Paul kind of looking at his own ministry saying, I want more than anything that you will stand firm, shine as lights in this dark and crooked generation, hold forth or hold fast that word of life. And Paul, one of the great joys that he gets is, I was like a father to these people. I was like the first guy that rolled through Philippi and these people, this church is growing and I'm looking forward to the day when we're all in heaven together and I can see, Lord, this work was not in vain. And he gets the joy of seeing the people that he is kind of, that Jesus brought along through Paul. And I add this because obviously he's talking about himself, but this is part of the hope that we have to look forward to. As you do these things, look forward to this. Um, one of the rewards that, that we have is to think, look at the people through, look at the people who came to the Lord through what I've been doing here. Okay, so, so um, almost done here. So the overall goal here is to glorify God. We do this by taking the gifts that he's given us. So new life, so our, the life, our strength, a new heart, money, time, energy, friends, church, connections that we have, like business connections, even anything that we have that God has given us to meet the needs of others. But not only that, we don't just meet the needs, but we do it cheerfully with a joy that comes from this new hope. Okay, it's critical. It's not just the action, but it's this joy, this hope, this love. But not just cheerfully, but at our own expense. Um, and, you know, I, I used to cry, think funny. I remember for just, like, I mean, there's different organizations where it's like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna serve. I gotta buy my own t-shirt. What's up with that, right? I used to think that's kind of weird. I'm gonna get a shirt, I'm serving. And it's like, you know what? The attitude is I'll pour myself out. If, I, if, if, if that's what it takes, if I gotta buy a $20 t-shirt in order to serve, I'll do it, right? I'll pay the 20 bucks and serve, okay? But we, do it, but we do it at our own expense, even suffering unjustly. And suffering unjustly in some context in the Bible means like serious persecution from the authorities. But it also means when you're helping people that don't, maybe don't wanna be helped or that they're just like, I don't care about any of this stuff, just give me my food, you know? We, 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 we greet that with an attitude. I, and, well. and then not just service, but in the name of Jesus, right? That's, 
In a sense, that's the capstone, and it should be more, I wish I could take like four bullet points, because part of the point here is going to be, we do this in the name of Jesus. It kind of doesn't count, certainly doesn't count as gospel outreach, if people just say, oh, look, there's a good person, just like that Mormon that rolled through. There's a good person, that's a nice guy. My neighbor's a nice guy, just like this guy, huh, whatever. That's not glorifying to God. Okay, last couple things um, to consider before we have a discussion. I was thinking about like some temptations. Uh, there's a, there, I have two different slides, temptations to omit the word and temptations to omit love. I forget the second one, but it's falling off the other side of the horse. These come directly from my own heart, I think. All right, so what are some temptations? So you're, you, you, you wanna serve, right? And for a lot of us, it's easier to actually do something than it is to like just talk about Jesus, right? One temptation is to give your primary energy and focus to meeting the physical need, but leaving no time or energy for meeting spiritual needs. Now, um, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. But, um, I, like when I say this, are there certain things like, what might you omit when you don't leave the right time or energy or space for that? I just wonder if that strikes a chord with anybody. Maybe you've helped them in a big way that you don't even stop toward the end of that help and say, hey, how can I pray for you? Or some, something that goes beyond the physical to opening the door to the spiritual. Right, right, right. So yeah, at the end, oops. Um, yeah, so yeah, that would be one example. I know I've had other examples where you just get done, it's like, oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta go home. I don't have time for you. I don't say that, right? But I gotta go home. And it's not even so much I don't have time for you, but um, there's real needs besides, besides the obvious ones that we might not even know about if we don't slow down and take the time. And then sometimes it's just awkward, I'm out of practice, I don't know what to say, that sort of thing. You know, if my problem is I don't know how to hold a conversation or start a conversation, maybe I should take a half hour at home and take the time to like figure it out. So those are the sort of things that kind of fit in here. If I just show up, then who knows what's going to happen, but if I plan, I pray, I'm creative, I might be able to work around that temptation. And this might be just me, right? Other people have different issues. Assume that other people just know that you're serving the name of Jesus or that they'll just ask, right? Well, I'm gonna serve graciously, humbly, joyfully, cheerfully. And uh, of course they know I'm doing it in the name of Jesus because that's what I'm doing. Or, well, I'm so different from everybody else. They're surely going to ask, well, what's different about you, <laughs> right? That happens, but that doesn't, I mean, but let's not assume that, right? Sometimes you just gotta take the bull by the horns and I mean, it's one of the easiest things is like, you know, gee, thank you, that was really nice of you. Well, um, you're welcome, I do it in the name of Jesus, right? Jesus gave me so much, I'd, I just wanna give you something, something like that. A third thing would be to be afraid of sounding like you're selling something. Okay, this is me, right? This comes out of my heart. And I don't know if other people struggle with this, but it's like, look, I'm doing this thing because I just love you, I wanna, I, you need help, I wanna help. Um, and now, it's like selling a timeshare. Well now, give me five minutes of your time because I've helped you so much, you owe it to me. And I'm gonna tell you about Jesus because that's what I'm here for really is to sell Jesus. And that's not what it is at all. Obviously that's not what's in my heart and that's not what most people are gonna perceive, but I get hung up on these things. But <laughs> anyway, the, any other thoughts though? Like what else are temptations to omit? Yeah. Um, one that I have all the time is like, kind of on the first one, people, Mm. The gospel, the verbal gospel is kind of offensive and they might not give me the thanks anymore. Like it's, you know what I mean? Absolutely, so for, I mean, for the microphone, yeah, Charlie's like, yeah, you definitely get thanked and patted on the back and, you know, for help that people really want and understand that they need, but for the things that they don't need, either they're offended or it's like, all right, you know, whatever. And it's, it's like, well, shoot, if I'm not gonna get thanked for it, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think sometimes uh, I'm afraid to share why I do what I do because then if I mess it up, if I mess something up, then it's like, oh great, did I do that in the name of Jesus too? But really that is, that is a gospel opportunity to talk yeah. so much as everything else. It's true. But like I remember once being like, I don't want people to know that I'm a Christian because then when I mess it up, they're gonna be like, you're supposed to have it right. And I didn't know how to respond to that. So I would just omit it. Right, and so just for the microphone here, yeah, Tracy says, uh, yeah, if you, if you don't let people know you're a Christian, then when you mess things up, it's no reproach on Christ. I don't have a fish on my car because if I'm an idiot in traffic, then no one's gonna think, well, that Christian's an idiot in traffic. He'll just <laughs> think he's some dude. Yeah, but, but as you're put to your point is that we shouldn't think of that as like, well, I don't wanna screw things up and dishonor Christ. We should think, you know, I'm imperfect. Um, and if I mess something up, I demonstrate 
you know, how Christ wants me to repent and fix it. Okay. The second thing is temptation to omit good works. Okay, so I don't, again, I don't know if this is, but anyway, for, take them for the, what they're worth. First of all is if we don't, if we see people or the work as a project. Okay, so if we see it's like, well, look, we're all right, guys. We're all bad, we should be out there outreaching more, so get out there on Saturday and outreach. It's like, all right, I guess I'll outreach and I'll talk to these people. So this is a, it's a lack of love, um, and so that's an attempt, so I would consider that lack of love not a good work. It, it guts the activity of being a good work, right? And people aren't idiots, they can figure that out. The second thing is serving without joy. Um, and again, this is something we just, I think we always gotta watch out for. I consciously, especially like with like Awana, for example, with little kids, I self-consciously think like, they, want, they don't wanna see an old man's face that's in his resting face that looks <laughs> bored, right? They wanna see somebody who's having as good a time as they are, right? They wanna see somebody smiling, and if somebody is disciplining them for something, it's done in love with a smile, right? So I try to think about my face to some degree. But serving without, but seriously, serving without joy guts the action of a good work. <clears throat> a third one would be waiting passively for opportunities, right? Again, guilty as charged. But um, I guess what I mean by this is, I might say like, well, I don't know what to do. And that's fair, because I feel like that a lot as well. I don't know what to do. I don't just say. But I mean, what do you do? This is where we actually actively, passionately, pray, consider, think, brainstorm, get with other people. Um, where you recognize that you personally are weak. If your weakness is, well, I've got a short temper, figure it out ahead of time. If your problem is you don't know how to hold a conversation, try to figure it out ahead of time. It's not like you can fix, we're all made differently, right? But um, don't wait passively for opportunities. If the problem is you don't know what the opportunity is, pray for one and you'll find individual opportunities. Talk with other people who are better at those kinds of thinking, thinking things up. Anyway, don't let it be a barrier. Any other thoughts? Actually, I, you know, thinking waiting passively for opportunities, I really believe what you said is when you find yourself doing that and you really don't know what to do, ask the Lord to open your eyes for opportunities. And you may be surprised what's all around you that you haven't noticed. Amen. And it doesn't have to be an organized thing. It's just that sometimes we're so worried about ourselves that we don't open our eyes to see what's just around us. And that may help solve that passively waiting to something like, whoa, you become overwhelmed with the number of opportunities there. Absolutely. And as you start to pray about those things, you start being prepared in your heart to respond quickly, right? So you, it's one thing to see it, and it's a second thing to be able to, oh, what, what do I do? What, what, oh, it's gone. Anyway, my experience is when I actually, I guess God gives me the sight and he gives me maybe the preparation at the same time. Okay. Takeaways, love people and glorify God. Okay, These re this really helps me. So, you know, my biggest concern for myself is that it's so much easier for me to focus on just serving. I'm pretty good at serving. I can serve, I, it doesn't, I, you know, but, but actually speaking is more difficult, right? But loving people, like knowing that I'm here for these people, what do they need more than anything else is they need to be brought to Jesus, that helps, and glorify God also. Yeah, God's glorified when people are doing good things instead of bad things, but God is so much more glorified when it's in the name of Jesus Christ. That, so this helps me a lot. Um, so do you need service or gospel outreach opportunity? Let's see, I don't remember where I was going with this. Um, oh, these are just like just sort of self-diagnostic type questions. Oops. Ah. Self-diagnostic type questions, but I guess I'll leave you with this, and we'll have a little bit of discussion, which kind of gets at, well, we'll have some discussion is in a smaller group. But I do want to leave it with this, and maybe some of you know this already, is God gives us this immense privilege of, of serving other, of working with him to serve people, right? God cares for people. We get to get in on the action, right? I can't believe that I get to do some of the things I get to do, right? Because it's like, you know, and I would, I would pay to do it. They don't make me pay, <laughs> right? But I would pay to do some of the stuff I get to do because it's, it's a joy. And sometimes it's, it's discouraging and sometimes it's a pain and sometimes it's like, I don't got time for that. Sometimes I get tired and a little bit over, overdo it. But the privilege of getting to join in the work of bringing people to Jesus is 100% worth it. So um, again, that helps me with my overall attitude. I can't, I get to do this. So with that, any other um, thoughts? Yes? I've discovered in myself, it's really easy to talk to God. I mean, just to say, yes. God is it, God bless you, God bless you. 
you blah, 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 blah. And it's true, but you know what's tough? Is to say Jesus Christ. Now, it's, I, I just think that's, if, if, there, if I don't hear the name of Jesus coming out of my mouth, then you're going to hell. Amen. It's easy to say church. It's easy to say, it's easy to say God. But when you say Jesus Christ, yeah. it's, that's, that's where you're making a distinction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good point. All right. I try to uh, train my mind to expect everything every day. Like, Lord, I'm here to serve you. What do you want me to do today? And be mindful of that throughout the whole day. Whoever's in front of me, how can I help these people? Or maybe they're helping me and, and accepting help and just expecting it. Lord, who do you want me to talk to today? And be on the lookout all day long, like I'm hunting, being on the lookout all day long for someone to, to serve or to talk to or to share Jesus, something like that. So I've been thinking the, the, the school bus drops off right in front of our church, like 350 every day, and like maybe 15, 20 high schoolers. And Lord, just putting that on my heart. And I was out there talking to a plumber on Friday, and sure enough, here comes the bus. And all these kids pour off. So next Sunday, ask me if I talk to the kids on the bus. All right. So, and they're dropped off right at the front porch. Awesome. I mean, how easy is that? <laughs> All right. So let me let me look out for opportunities. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll split into small groups for the discussion. I don't have an actual class notes handout, but we do have some provocative discussion questions. All right. So let's pray. <laughs> Father, you are, you are so good to us, first of all, to call us out of darkness and bring us into your light. Um, we have zero power uh, to, to do that, to, but you have um, you've brought into each of our lives people that have shared with us the gospel so that we would know you and know the kindness that you have and your willingness to forgive and the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus who took our place, took our sins on the cross. Um, so, Father, thank you for bringing us into your church, and thank you for giving us these marching orders, right, that bring us into your joy of going out and serving other people with action, with attitude, with behavior, with speech, but also with proclaiming the gospel to them as well. Father, I would pray that for the people here in the room that, that, that you would give us a taste of the joy that we get by stepping out even a little bit, praying just a little bit for specific guidance and for specific opportunities in our lives um, to just to, to, to speak the name Jesus and to care for people that we might not actually otherwise um, care for. So as we do that, Father, would you please help us find opportunities as individuals, as a church, as just Christians, to, um, to go out into the world and be lights, to, to, to serve other people well, um, and then also to um, proclaim your name so that other people would know that Jesus saves, that Jesus is Lord. And so help us with that, please, in Jesus' name, amen.